The federal conservatives are saying that if Prime Minister Justin Trudeau does not step down and Liberal MPs don't force him out, then they're accepting corruption. This, of course, is in reaction to the We Charity scandal, which has rocked the hill. To talk more about it is political reporter Brian Lilly. Brian, the Bloc is even saying that Trudeau should step aside for Deputy PM Christopher Freeland. Yeah, both parties, let's be honest with this, Hal, both parties playing a bit of mischief in politics with this. I, I don't blame them for saying the PM should step down over this. It's, it's serious. It's sketchy in terms of the way that his government, with all the ties between the Trudeau Liberals and the We Charity, how they were able to give this almost $1 billion contract, $912 million. It would pay We more than $43 million to administer the program how they were able to get this through without anyone ever recusing themselves. But, you know, the Conservatives are, are trying to say, oh, you bad people, if, if you don't force Justin Trudeau out, you're, with, you're standing with corruption. And then the Bloc's over there on the other side, and they had several questions. Justin Trudeau took a personal day on Monday, but since then they've been asking questions saying, will you step aside for Christia Freeland? They're honestly just trying to drive a wedge between Trudeau and Freeland. And... You know, as a political junkie, it is kind of fun to watch. I'll admit that. As for the We Charity scandal itself and how much Justin Trudeau's family and friends benefited, our PM really hasn't said very much. No, he's still trying to pawn this off on the uh, what he keeps calling the professional public service or the nonpartisan public service. He's trying to say that, well, it wasn't really his government. You know, well, we didn't make this decision. They did. Those guys over there. Yeah, that's the ticket. It's a bit like an old Saturday Night Live skit. Well, look, we had testimony from Rachel Wernick, who's the senior bureaucrat on this file last week. And she said clearly that we was pitching the government. Now, there's nothing wrong with we pitching the government on a proposal. The government shoveling money out the door. We wants to make a proposal. They probably should have registered to lobby. Turns out they have not. And that's another issue. But as far as them pitching the government and saying, we can help you, we've got all these ideas for helping youth during the pandemic, no issue with that. The government, though, keeps saying, we didn't make a decision on this. This was all the idea of the, the public service. We was pitching ministers Chagger, who's in charge of the program, and Minister Ng, at the least. There are probably others, in addition to senior civil servants throughout the government, by mid-April. Uh, Bartis Jagger admits that she met with Craig Kielberger, the co-founder co of WE, on April 27th. Why is that important? That is five days before the government even mentioned the program in public. And on the day that the PM mentions it, Rachel Wernick, that top public servant, gets a detailed proposal sent to her by Craig Kielberger because he knew what was coming down the pipe. You know, you can't say that this is all on the public service when so many politicians are actually involved. Now, Brian, you've done a lot of digging into the real estate surrounding we and the Kielberger family. Now, your contention is that they have some odd transactions and uh, really owe Canadians an explanation. Why is that? They owe Canadians an explanation because this is a family that has really rose to prominence through their charity and through their association with we. Now, not all the properties involved are, are or were owned by we. Some of them were owned by private companies set up by the Kielberger family, but often they were used by we or affiliated with we in some way. And some of these in, in my uh, research, what I found is that they sold below the assessed market value by the city. Now, I don't know how things run in Alberta, but if you remember from your time in Ontario, Hal, the city assessment of your property is normally well below what you could sell the place for or even what you bought it for. The city assessment trails the market value and it's just used to determine what your tax rate will be. I don't know why it's like that, but it is. And when you're selling a million dollar property for $250,000 or more, less than what the city assesses it at, that raises red flags. There are also a lot of um, transactions with family property where it goes from one family member to another to another to a numbered company and you know in one case the price went from 3.7 million to zero to 800,000 to zero again before ending up in the hands of a numbered company owned by the in-law of Craig Kielberger and you're sitting there saying okay what's this about and you can't just say well it's personal we don't have to tell you no this is strange I showed it to uh, people who were involved in real estate for a quarter century and they say you know, I've seen a lot of transfers between family members, but this is odd.
Now, there have been some questions raised as to paying people to volunteer, which essentially means it's not really volunteering, and the amount of money on offer could range from 5 to 10 bucks an hour, which is well below minimum wage. What has the government said about this? Well, they've said it wasn't really a wage, and that's something that they tried to defend extensively at committee this week. But it's one of the reasons that groups like Volunteer Canada said they wouldn't participate with this once we said they would agree. You know, we took on the contract and then said, oh, we don't know how to place people with volunteers. We're really good at engaging youth, but how do we place people? Let's ask Volunteer Canada to help out. They had several meetings. Volunteer Canada looked and said, wait, you're going to pay people? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to incentivize them. Okay, but you're paying them less than minimum wage. Yet, yeah, Don't worry about that. Volunteer Canada stepped aside. At its best, it would be $10 an hour because you get a reward based on 100 hour of volunteer community service increments. So if you volunteer 100 hours, you get $1,000. That works out to $10 an hour. But Hal, if I went to a community group and I put in 190 hours, well, I'm still only getting $1,000 for that 100 hours. You know, the other 90 hours doesn't count. Labor lawyers, the New Democrats, lots of volunteer groups have raised red flags and said, this is bizarre. Some, some charities have even said, this puts us in a liability risk if we participate in such a program because we are effectively paying people to come out, but we're not paying them what the provincial minimum wage is. We're not following labor standards. This causes problems for us. The government has said, oh, no, 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 you're completely misunderstanding. Just look the other way. I don't think that you actually can. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper was recently quoted in a British newspaper as saying that Canada and the UK should not rely so heavily on China. Brian, this comes at the same time a poll says Canadians want less economic reliance on the Asian nation. There's a very well-written op-ed in the Daily Telegraph out of London, and, and I highly recommend it. If, if you follow me on social media, you can find it, or follow Stephen Harper on social media, you will find this. And he looks at what he's calling the Indo-Pacific century, and he says, we've got two choices as, as a country. We can you know, try and play up to China, or we can play up to India and other free-minded de democratic-type countries like India, Japan, uh, places like Singapore, uh, Australia and uh, South Korea and others who don't have the same despotic dictatorial view of the world that China does. And he really, he commends Britain for walking away from making Huawei part of the, their 5G network and says, we need to make a decision. Uh, he calls on Canada to make the same decision. Under the Trudeau government, that's doubtful at this point. But because of the two Michaels, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, because of the Huawei controversy, because of the trade war that China's launched against Canada, Canadian public opinion is turning against the dictators in Beijing. And more and more people are saying, and, and the latest is an Ipsos poll saying, you know what, this simply isn't worth it. We need to look elsewhere. I'm glad to see that happening. I've been an advocate for more than 15 years of greater uh, ties with India, which, you know, Although there are problems with democracy in India, it is still a democracy and it's far more in line with uh, our values in terms of the structure of the government than what the people running uh, in Beijing see as the right way to go. Now, Brian, let's turn our attention now to the COVID-19 pandemic. Alberta briefly jumped to become the province with the highest number of active COVID-19 cases per capita. Ontario has also seen a recent jump in the amount of younger people infected with the virus. Is this is what we're calling a, a second wave right now? I don't think we're quite at the second wave because we're not through the first, but both are seeing upticks. And it's interesting that the media jumped and said, oh, look, Alberta, you know, you guys open way too fast. And that's why you've got the most active cases per capita. Well, they still have far few cases, fewer cases than Ontario or uh, Quebec. But it's interesting that they jumped on that stat. In Ontario, after weeks of going down, they started to tick up the way. And, you know, I'll give you one example in particular, Ottawa, town you know well, it's gone up. Well, most of the people are under the age of 39. And there's been talk of major house parties being vectors for this. Uh, the Byward Market, um, which is a, you know, a restaurant and bar district, there have been photos of people doing anything but social distancing. So, you know, look, we're opening back up, but you still have to be careful. You still have to... Uh, make sure that you, you practice some good public health guidelines. 
and some people aren't. And that's the problem here. Uh, so are we going to see the hospitals start spiking back up if a bunch of people under 40 get this? Not in the same way we would if people over 60 got it, but it's still a cause for concern because if it becomes wider spread, then it starts spreading to older demographics who are more vulnerable. You know, this is unlike uh, swine flu of a few years ago, which disproportionately affected young people and children. This affects older people. And in swine flu, they weren't bothered by it. It didn't bug them at all. So we've got to watch how this spreads through the community. And right now there's some worrying signals in, in both Alberta and Ontario, and I'm, I'm sure other provinces if we looked. You know, it's interesting, too. I went for a hike to Red Rock Canyon at Waterton Lakes National Park, beautiful area, uh, the past weekend. And there were hundreds upon hundreds of people there, not social distancing, nobody wearing masks. And it was just amazing to see you know, everybody congregate in that same area. And there's also a push here in Lethbridge in southern Alberta to have the, the mayor institute a bylaw saying that everybody should wear masks indoors. So remains to see what's going to happen. Now, Brian, there's also a push to change policing across North America in the wake of George Floyd's death. In Calgary, Mayor Nahed Nenshi is warning about a tough discussion after unanimous vote on police funding called for a review. And in Toronto, there was a lot of graffiti and denunciation of police racism, which Toronto's black police chief doesn't actually agree with. Uh, Mark Saunders has taken issue with this. And, you know, it's interesting that it was a couple of the people that were arrested for graffiti on places like uh, uh, statues at Queen's Park, including Sir John A. Macdonald. Well, they're hardly visible minorities. They're very white liberals. Um, one apparently a school teacher. So uh, there's a lot of questions about how, you know, is, is this really about anti-black racism? Is it about politics? Mark Saunders is someone who came up through the ranks in Toronto's police force and became a black man leading the biggest police force in the country. And he talks about communities which are predominantly people of color and the fact that they call and say, look, we don't need you to go away. We need you here. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Jamil Giovanni, who is a um, uh, an advisor to Premier Ford, who has called defunding of police a ridiculous idea that won't help the communities, those advocating for uh, claim it will. And in fact, many of the people advocating for this don't live in communities that are dealing with high levels of crime and violence. And those would be the first affected if we had a defunding movement. By the way, for anyone that thinks defunding just means cut the police budget a little bit, no, you need to listen to them carefully. There are some people calling for that, and that's a valid discussion. I, I've long been a critic of police budgets that go up every year without any thinking. But if you're just going to follow the defund police movement, you will find that some people want police gone completely. And that, I think, would be a disaster. Brian, let's talk a bit now about the federal Tory leadership race. We recently had Aaron O'Toole on our program discussing such. And then there's also Peter McKay, Leslie Lewis, Derek Sloan. What have you heard? Who are the main front runners right now? Well, right now, it is still a, a main race between Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay. There is a path to victory, I think, for Leslie Lewis, although it's a thin path. I don't see a path to victory for Derek Sloan. So there's two social conservatives in the race, Derek Sloan and uh, Leslie Lewis. Leslie Lewis, if you're looking at the groups that back them respectively, she has more of the, um, uh, the support of groups like uh, the Canada Christian College, headed up by Charles McVitie in Toronto, Leslin, or Derek Sloan, more the um, uh, LifeSite news crowd. You know, it, it's not homogenous between either one of them, but generally those are the groups backing those two. But Leslin Lewis has been able to break away from just being the social conservative candidate and has attracted more people uh, through other issues in a way that Derek Sloan hasn't been able to. Um, so is there a way for her to get in through the race? Absolutely. Peter McKay and his team think they've got this sewn up on the first ballot. Simple fact of the matter is they've sold less than 50,000 memberships from what I've been told by McKay insiders. Less than 50,000 memberships. There are 269,000 members. Well, unless, you know, there's a good chunk of those existing members backing you, you're not going to win on the first ballot. If Leslie Lewis finishes high enough, She's hoping that Derek Sloan supporters go to her second and that then maybe uh, there's enough of uh, anybody but Peter or Aaron uh, view to push her over the top. There are a number of people that I've spoken to who said, look, 
Aaron O'Toole, Peter McKay, both good men, but neither one's exciting me. I'm voting Leslin on the first ballot. If enough of that happens, we could have what we describe in Ontario as the Bob Ray effect. I'm voting for Bob Ray out of protest. Uh, what, the NDP won? So that could happen here. Um, like I said, it's a narrow path to victory. Other than, you know, outside of that happening, it's a tough battle between uh, O'Toole and McKay. And we'll see, you know, who of the three that have the potential comes out on top. You know, I wonder if people are willing to give uh, Leslie Lewis a shot as well, because she's not a professional politician that worked a lot, that worked quite well for Donald Trump in the last federal election down in the States. You know, so maybe they want some, somebody new and refreshing instead of McKay and O'Toole, who are professional politicians, right? I think that she has benefited a great deal by the fact that a lot of this campaign has been a virtual campaign and she's done very well on social media. Uh, she did not perform as well in the debates as a lot of people think. I'll give her, cut her some slack on the French debates. French is, you know, not her second language. She tried her best, but even in English, she didn't perform up to expectations. So she still needs some polish. She needs to become a better speaker. Uh, and if she wins, she's going to have a, a big learning curve ahead of her. But the fact that this has mainly been fought through, you know, mail to your door or email or Twitter, that's helped her a lot because she's tapped into issues that a lot of conservatives feel the professional politicians just aren't talking about or not talking about in ways that resonate with them. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching.